Hello, and thank you for coming tonight on this beautiful spring evening. Uh, I am. I want to thank our host, uh, Onyx Studio and partner, and we want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Lenape people. I am Kay Matchlot, and I am the founding director of Media Art Exploration, known as MAX, and we produce and present live arts that intersects with science and technology. We present this work in biennial festivals. One's coming up in November, so join us there. And we have a production this spring of Annie Dorson's Prometheus Firebringer in mid-May. We are co-presenting and producing with New York Live Arts and The Chocolate Factory. Uh, it's a short run, so there, I suggest you get your tickets fast. It is mysterious, uncanny, and needs to be experienced live. Uh, so, um, and we also get another angle on this intersection with our Max Forums. And tonight is our first Max Forum of our spring series. And you can find out about the other two and about Prometheus Firebringer on our website. And we want to thank New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York State Council on the Arts for their support of this series. So tonight, we, have, we are really delighted to have these minds in the same room along with you in real time. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, LLMs, large language models, of which ChatGPT is the most pervasive and the one you might be familiar with right now. Um, there's a lot of acronyms in this world of CS and AI. You can't avoid them. So um, I, I, we're really, really delighted to have Tal Lindzen and Annie Dorson here tonight to, um, to, to uh, speak and to converse. And Tal is a um, assistant professor of linguistics and data science at NYU, where he also directs the computational and psycholinguistic lab. He, where they use behavioral experiments as well as computational method to study how people learn and understand language. They also develop systems to improve the way computers process language, and we call that process natural language processing, or NLPs. So, and he can tell you much more about what he does and uh, will be much clearer. Um, and Annie Dorson is a theater maker and 2019 MacArthur Fellow. And Annie has been making what she calls algorithmic theater since way before the word algorithm was in the vernacular. She uh, works, she collaborates with software, with programmers, and she uses customized software programs to create work that takes advantage of a theater audience's focused attention over time. So it unfolds in real time a little differently every night. So you can come to Prometheus Firebringer a couple times and see something different. So she creates these performances with algorithms alongside human performers, if you will. Um, so, uh, we are really looking forward and we're thrilled we, to present Prometheus Firebringer in this crucial moment of our society's interface with this technology. It was originally developed in our Max Machina laboratory and we're uh, thrilled to have Annie back here and to have Prometheus Firebringer coming to you in May. So um, I want to invite them all to the stage and with Ling Ling Yang, my co-curator of this series, she will moderate tonight and I want to thank her for her um, invaluable contribution to this series and to Max. And, and then I want to encourage all of you, there's QR codes right by the door and on the bar, and you can donate to Max, which just use your smartphone. So we would welcome any donations so we can continue the work. Thank you again so much for coming, and I turn it over to Thank you. Is this okay? Thank you for joining us. Um, so I think right now we're going to sort of um, start with Tall. Um, and Tall, I'm wondering if you could just give us um, a sort of overview of the field of cognitive psychology and computational linguistics, and kind of um, let us into like help us give us an idea of where you stand and what your research entails, maybe. 
Um, yeah, sure. So um, cognitive psychology studies how people uh, learn, think, interact with the world. Um, and uh, my specific interest is in language, so people learn language or um, read, understand language, produce language. Um, the computational linguistics side of it uh, means that we develop uh, computer systems that can understand language or um, do stuff with language. And the intersection between those two areas, which is where my interest is in primarily, is in um, using those computational systems to understand uh, people better. So basically, we try to develop um, simulations of how people um, understand language and learn language. And through studying those simulations, we can maybe learn something about people. Great, thank you. Um, do you have any examples of some of the um, experiments you might run or like how, what does it look like mm. basically? What does your work look like in the lab or kind yeah. of like what, what kind of questions basically are you asking maybe a little bit more specifically? Yeah, so there are two kinds of uh, visuals I guess that go with my work. One is just like me at a computer. Uh, that's the computational side of it. And then the other one is uh, running human experiments. So um, we have people come into the lab and read stuff. And we have this um, eye tracker, uh, which is a simple machine that uh, tracks your eyes uh, as you kind of follow a sentence. And then we, we can tell exactly how long it takes you to read each word and uh, when you go back to reread stuff. And uh, that gives us an... Uh, this kind of window into how you understand language in, in real time. Um, so that's the sort of uh, behavioral psychology aspect of it. And then the computational stuff is, yeah, you just like write, write code and then uh, you have the program. It's this is mostly a machine learning program, so they kind of learn on their own. Um, and we just give them a bunch of text and then from, they try to figure out what um, English is like just from looking at those texts. And so we run experiments with those machine learning models as well. It's like the human side and the like AI side of it. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah. please. Um, with the, with the um, experiments you do with humans, subjects, uh, do you do like a qualitative aspect of that too? Do you ask them where they feel that they were taking extra time or words that they didn't know so you can compare like their hmm. perception? of their reading with what the computer eye tracker does? Well, we asked them questions about the sentence, uh, wh what they understood from the sentence. Um, we don't ask them so much about the experience of reading, though that's a really good idea. You're welcome. <laughs> we should do that. Um, I want a hat tip in the published. Uh... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and then, in addition to figuring out how humans think, right, you're also interested in developing better AI. Right. Um, can you give us an overview of, like, maybe help us understand where AI development, and Annie, you'll, I think, through your work, we'll also get a, a sense of this, but where AI development has come from and where it's going? Can just, like, a quick, get us all on the same page, maybe? Yeah, so uh, people have tried a, a lot of different approaches to AI over the last few um decades and and some of those systems uh, you would just have something like a grammar book of English uh, programmed into the system and then you would have a set of rules that told the system well if the input is uh, this word then you should say that word um, and that was the kind of system that people use for for decades and it worked okay I think a lot of um, Annie's work used uh, systems like that um, but then in the last uh, decade, I guess, it uh, turned out that with uh, computers becoming faster, um, you can actually uh, get them to learn um, everything that they need to learn about language just from observing a lot of texts. Um, so you don't need to teach them anything about English, you just figure everything out on their own, um, which is a really surprising thing that has happened in the field the last decade. Uh, so that's where we're now. Um, the systems that look most convincing uh, in terms of how well they understand uh, language are systems that basically observe the entire internet, like trillions of words from the internet, and figure out certain patterns um, in those sentences, and often uh, just say the right sentence in the right moment that they just remember from the um, internet. Um, so that's kind of where, where the field is, is at. Um, and 
because my, my own interests are primarily in systems that learn like people, uh, this approach is not fully satisfying because, of course, people don't learn by like uh, looking at uh, trillions of words from the internet. We learn language in a very different way. Uh, we interact with the world. We have a limited amount of time. Um, so for every, you know, like a, a, a child can learn English from uh, 20 million words, let's say, so like way, way fewer words than those big language models. Um, so a, a lot of my research is to make um, models that are more similar to humans in how they learn and kind of less um, data hungry. Yeah. Great. Well, maybe we'll get into some of those examples a little bit later. Um, but Annie, mm. um, so you've just had a kind of retrospective of your work at Bridmar um, in algorithmic theater. And in May, as Kay said, we'll be presenting um, your newest work, Prometheus Firebringer. Um, can you kind of introduce your work, introduce yourself to the audience and get a sense, so we can give a, get a sense of um, what drew you to theater making in the first place and then algorithmic theater in particular? Okay, I think uh, what drew me to theater in the first place, I think, was that my older sister did plays in high school. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, uh, you know, I want to be just like her, so I should do plays. Uh, so that's not really very interesting to hear about. <laughs> um, but algorithmic theater started, uh, I made a piece called Hello, Hi There um, in 2009, like, 10. Uh, and um, I'd had an idea that I wanted to do something with this old debate between Noam Chomsky and Michel Foucault uh, from the 70s. It was on Dutch television, and it was meant to be like these two philosophers facing off, you know, about human nature and power and language and creativity. Um, and I thought it was a super interesting conversation, in part because it's like not a very good conversation. Uh, if you think that the, you know, uh, what's exciting about like watching people talk is that you might uh, see them or experience yourself new ideas, like see them create new ideas or change their thinking. Uh, and in that debate, like Chomsky and Foucault pretty much stick to their corners and they just basically repeat what they had each said in like many other contexts many times before. So I thought like, okay, so here's an example where in a way you could almost think of the two of them as like just, um, you know, repeating from memory something that they already thought and already knew. Uh, but that kind of came later. A friend of mine said like, oh, if you're interested in this conversation, you should read Alan Turing's 1950 essay on computing machinery and intelligence, which is a essay that really like is like rings the starting bell on natural language programming in a lot of ways. Uh, and Turing's big insight was that you don't need to try to figure out how to you know, write a program that will actually think, because we don't really know what thinking is. But if you could write a program that could teach a computer how to generate language that could trick a human into thinking that the computer was thinking, then you've done it. That's artificial intelligence, right? So that's like the famous imitation game, which you've probably heard of. Um, and I thought it was theater, basically. It's about creating an illusion of uh, human thought just through language uh, that should somehow be like believable, right? So like it's about the suspension of disbelief or it's about convincing some kind of an audience that there's like a real person doing something intellectual or so, um, you know, that was the kind of genesis of Hello, Hi There. I worked with a um, kind of, a, I don't know, chatbot like hobbyist uh, who helped me. Well, he would totally kill me. This can't go on the internet now because he's not really a hobbyist. He's a total professional. But <laughs> at the time, I did not know that. So uh, I won't say his name anyway. Um, and uh, he helped me, like, program a couple of chatbots and rig them to talk to each other instead of to a human, which is what they're normally designed to do. Um, and I made a little piece that is sort of like about all the same things that the Chomsky Foucault debate is about, except it's two chatbots, two like really, really dumb chatbots talking. So they, this is like old technology. I made the piece in that premiered in 2010. It, this was already 20 years out of date technology when I made the piece. Uh, and that was intentional uh, for two reasons. I know you want to play that clip. I can see you thinking oh, about no. it. Um, the two reasons that I had for that, one, I wanted it to match the era that Chomsky and Foucault 
were speaking in, so that it was sort of the ideas that were current at the same time that they were uh, doing their debate. But I also loved like working with a really dumb program because audiences could kind of see how it was working just from watching it run. So it was simple enough that I understood the programming concepts that an audience, like after watching for 20 minutes or something, would also kind of start to get the idea, as Tal was saying, you know, if you see this word, respond to that word. If you get a certain kind of question, you should answer this kind of way. It's just really, really simplistic, and it runs from a little database of statements that I entered by hand, you know, laboriously over hours and hours. And, uh, and that was the beginning. And, and then I started thinking about all the other ways in which um, computational logic, algorithmic logic, would be uh, like an interesting proposition for the theater that you could watch the changes and outputs of an algorithm over time, the way you might watch like a protagonist in a more traditional play. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, speaking of uh, repeating things from uh, memory, um, I just read a, there was an, an op-ed that uh, Chomsky published yes. a, um, a couple of months ago uh, that could have been word to word something that he would have said in the 70s. So, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, completely. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the other, yeah. No, no, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say, like, I sort of wanted to just flag that you said remember when you were talking about LLMs, because uh -huh. that's, in my understanding, not what they do. Um, I will sometimes um, use language that is not precise, but uh, what do you mean? What, how, how do they not, <laughs> the how do, they not uh, do it? Um, yeah. Well, I, I don't think of them as um, having like thoughts or language that they're recalling from somewhere. They're more, it's like an autocomplete, but like mm -hmm. a fancy, like super juiced autocomplete. Yeah. Um, but that's not like remembering. I just want to... I'm just gonna be annoying like that about mm. anthropomorphizing language. Yeah, that's that's fair. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I came into this expecting to be. Um, uh, no, just joking. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to say yes. about um, chatbots is that it's uh, surprisingly easy to um, make people think that they're talking to an intelligent uh, human. So even like those uh, ancient chatbots from the 60s, the, the like fake psychiatrist, uh, for, uh, Eliza, I think it was called. So like half of the people thought they were actually chatting with the psychiatrist, even though it was like, you know, the dumbest chatbot you can imagine. So uh, yeah, it's very hard. Uh, it's very easy to fool people into thinking uh, that something is intelligent, uh, it turns out. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually, this is a question that I've had. So Eliza is like kind of the first chatbot, right? Like Joseph Weizenbaum made 66, I think. And um, I, do you guys know the story of Eliza at all? Like, so the, there's like this little story, which is probably totally apocryphal, but um, Weizenbaum said that, you know, one day he came into his office and his uh, secretary, this whole thing is like super gendered in really weird ways too. Um, but he came into his office and his secretary was sobbing, was crying her eyes out talking to his little chat bot, which had been designed to kind of imitate like a therapist. Uh, and so she was, you know, talking about all her problems. And, um, and he then was like horrified, he said, because he did not expect that people would fall for this so easily. And he called this the Eliza effect that his little therapist chat bot like convinced, you know, his secretary uh, that she was talking to a real person or that there was like something in there that could be like genuinely responsive in some way. And um, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about using LLMs as therapists for the poor. Mm. I don't know if you've heard about this. This is like the yes. great, brilliant idea. This is how Silicon Valley thinks um, is uh, that, well, you know, they've got a mental health crisis in this country and like nobody can afford doctors and healthcare is so expensive. So we'll just give like people who can't afford health insurance, we'll just give them chat bots to talk to, and that'll be just like talking to a therapist. So my question, you were like the perfect person to ask this to, mm -hmm. like why are, you know, technologists like so into using these things for therapy? Why therapy, sp I mean, they're, they're into using these things for everything. I don't know if it's just therapy, also for no, not medicine. Therapy, but like they are, like, that's like a weird yeah. thing that it like keeps coming back and back and back, <laughs> this sort of fantasy of like a therapist. Mm. 
well, maybe they think that therapists don't actually do anything. They just ask you, uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, the, the, uh, <laughs> I remember um, looking at the, the, the source code for um, Eliza, and, and if, if it didn't know um, what to say, it would say something like, um, tell me more about this, or what makes you feel that way, or, you know. Um, and, <laughs> and it works in most contexts, like, um, so, so I think, no, 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 it, it works in terms of like fooling people into thinking that they're talking into, to, to a human. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. it has um, effective outcomes in curing mental illness, that's not what I meant to say. Um, but, uh, so maybe that's the image that the technologists have of what therapists um, do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's, uh, and also they think that uh, they can fix everything just with writing code and they're bored with um, the state and all of the institutions that we currently have to address those problems. They think they just like magically by being uh, incredibly intelligent people sitting on their own with the computer and never talking to anyone else, they can fix uh, society. Um, so, yeah. Those are my hypotheses <laughs> as a scientist. I them. Yeah. Um, now, okay. maybe. Is that a good time? Oh, oh I was thinking thing? we yeah. could just roll just a little clip. Yeah, sure. This is going to premiere in 2010. Welcome at the fourth debate of the International Philosophers Project. Tonight's debaters are Mr. Michel Foucault of the Collège de France and Mr. Noam Chomsky. Chomsky says humans can make more output than they take in as input. There's a gap that he calls creativity. I'm with Chomsky. His heart is in the right place. <laughs> so what you're trying to say is that Chomsky is an idiot, but he means well, right? Don't worry about Chomsky dying. He'll be on YouTube forever. Lol. I was thinking the same thing. Haha. Ha. And no matter how many times you play this video, it stays the same. Yeah. In the video, Chomsky has only one possible output for every input of Faucault's. And it's the same with video Faucault. He only has one option for every input of Chomsky's. The video just stays the same, the same thing over and over again. The video is like one long loop. I never loop. Do you? Boring. Haha. Ha. How many different things can you say in response to boring? Haha. Ha. Many, but I don't know how many. That's cool. So you're more creative than video Chomsky. <laughs> I can't talk about the weather. So I guess that means I'm very, very creative. Okay, how is the weather? The weather is unseasonably mild for this time of year. <laughs> so one of the things that I, was, that I was really aiming to do with that is sort of demonstrate a little bit the emptiness of the language that comes and that the sort of objectification of language um, that computational, like natural language programming sort of entails. Uh, it turns words into tokens, you know, it turns uh, language into sort of a mathematical proposition. So there's a separation between like the sort of, I don't know, like the materiality of the words and the meaning that words seem to produce sense, but there's no sense behind. So like they go on talking about the weather for a little bit sometimes and you know, they have no, it's, it's actually a lot of the conversations we're having now about ChatGPT and other things that they have no external reference for anything that they say. So it's just a language game that doesn't refer to the world in any sense. Um, but that is much easier to see with this stupid technology than it is with the like quite impressive and clever technology behind uh, LLMs. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you could walk us through some of the other works from a piece of work, and then maybe we can, I don't know how much time we want to spend, but then um, make it to Prometheus and sort of um, yeah. 
any insights you have on kind of, because you really, in all of these works, you're kind of demonstrating the progress of these technologies, maybe not one-to-one -one with where they are. Mm. Is that a correct? I mean, if that is true, it was not super intentional. Mm. Um, and like, I didn't think of myself as like marching from like a 1960s or 70s era chatbot like up until now, although I think you might be right that that's a little bit what happened. Um, so after making this, I sort of started thinking that the, the, the active agent in these pieces is like the algorithm, right? So then it was 2012 that I started using this phrase algorithmic theater to describe the work. And I thought, well, since I've now been talking about algorithmic theater, I should like make some. Uh, and uh, so I thought I would do something with Hamlet I still wanted to use um, a, like a very rudimentary uh, like technological process uh, that still seemed important. So I decided to use Markov chains, um, which are uh, kind of a, it's like a famous algorithm. It's like a way of resequencing language from a corpus. Um, and it's based on probabilities, but it's, it's also um, quite simple. And if anyone's interested in how that work, I can tell you after. Uh, but, Basically, it could make like a new uh, adaptation of Hamlet at every performance by simply resequencing the words according to like a pretty simple mathematical equation. Um, and then we linked the language as it was being generated in real time in the performance to the lighting, the sound, stage effects. So it was, you know, I used to call it, it's like my literal Hamlet machine. It's like mm -hmm. the, all the sort of apparatus of theater is sort of generating Hamlet's, uh, Hamlet-ish performances, Hamletishness. Um, and uh, so that was that one. Um, then I thought, well, let's get a little more sophisticated. And I wanted to experiment with, oh, yeah, that's fun, uh, with um, uh, evolutionary algorithms, which are kind of a very schematic um, model of like biological evolution. Um, it's uh, a kind of technique where you like you populate, like, you're trying to solve a problem or you're trying to move one thing somewhere else and you populate, like, a million different options randomly and then those that are closer to your target get retained. Things that are far from your target get thrown out and then you kind of using mutation and other sort of, uh, like, ideas sort of borrowed from biology, repopulate a new generation and if you keep doing that, like, thousands and thousands and thousands of time, over time, your little group your little population will get closer to your target. Um, so I wanted to try this out, and I decided to see if I could get the song Yesterday uh, by the Beatles to turn into Tomorrow from the musical Annie. We tried this with like a very strict, you know, evolutionary algorithm, and finally the program I was working with said like, you know, Annie, this is like, the sun will grow cold before we get anywhere near <laughs> like the target. It's just too many options and too, we would get to like 33% of, of the way there and then it would just stop for like days. We kept the laptops running and it was like, you're never gonna get there. So we did uh, a slightly different algorithmic function uh, with a little bit of evolutionary uh, sprinkles on top. Um, and that piece was sung by three singers um, who were, like, were sight singing, so the scores were being, again, generated live. Music was always a little different. Um, but we got to tomorrow, which was the main point. And um, then, I guess the last algorithm piece is maybe Great Outdoors, which is where, um, you know, I did start, I was having a lot of conversations with computer scientists all the time about what they were working on, and what was interesting, and um, sorry, I know this is all very <laughs> like rudimentary, but uh, so I was working with this guy from New Zealand, and he was like, oh, I've been playing around with word to vec which was a, um, <clears throat> this is like now we're in 2000, I don't know, 14, I guess, and um, word to vec was a new idea of how to um, like graph the relationships between words mathematically uh, and spatially um, and it was a very important part of the development of these kinds of deep learning, large language model techniques. Um, it, was a, it was like, maybe, well, I don't know, you correct me if this is not true, but in my understanding, it was like the first natural language programming technique that really accounted for semantics, for like the meaning of words, and created like a, a mathematical way of describing the relationship between the meaning of words. Um, 
So uh, I did a little piece. It was also like 2016 and, you know, Trump and the rest. And so um, I did a piece kind of about the internet. Uh, it was set in an inflatable planetarium because uh, I also felt it would be nice just to kind of be with people together in a nice way. Um, and we made a little star show uh, in the planetarium and uh, wrote an algorithm that would do like a big scrape of all kinds of social media sites and um, Reddit and also some sort of like nasty, like we did the Donald on, on Reddit and we did uh, 4chan and stuff. And then <clears throat> use a um, uh, <clears throat> word to back to kind of try to model uh, like the theory of entropy. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. We, <laughs> we basically arranged a sampling of that big scrape into a kind of dramatic structure. Um, and it was read by an actress, wonderful actress, um, <clears throat> Kaya Matisse. Uh, and now then at that point, there was like already people were starting to talk with me about, um, uh, you know, what we now know of as like GPT-4. I think it was still the first one back then. I started thinking about doing something with the myth of Prometheus a long, long time ago because it seemed like such an obvious subject matter for me, um, thinking about the trade-offs of technology and the relationship between technology and power. Uh, and um, so I thought, okay, well, I've got to do, I've got to do, <clears throat> you know, a um, generative AI piece because, you know, I have to at some point and I have to do a Prometheus point piece at some point. So I might as well do like a generative AI Prometheus piece and get it all out of the way at once, in one go. Two birds, one stone. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that. There we are. Yeah, there we are. Um, yeah, could you give us an idea? I don't want to, no spoilers, you have to come to the show, but could you give us an idea of kind of what it looks like and the outlines of Prometheus? Yeah, so the original, original notion uh, was that um, you know, Prometheus, the play by Aeschylus, or attributed to Aeschylus, was originally part of a trilogy. Uh, and the second, the second play and the third play are lost. So we only have Prometheus Bound, which was the first one. Uh, Prometheus Unbound, there's like some fragments. Uh, and then Percy Bysshe Shelley wrote what he thought should have been the play. Uh, and the third play, uh, Prometheus Firebringer, uh, there was just one line that still existed, Again, totally apocryphal, almost certainly. It's like some Roman guy wrote down something that he read in some Greek book that we no longer have that was like this scene of the thing and all he could remember is the one line. Uh, and so I thought, okay, great. This is a perfect thing for generative AI. You know, I'm gonna start, uh, I'm gonna like use this one line and then like construct the play around it with, you know, stupid. Didn't work at all. Uh, didn't do anything interesting. Um, but I did think, okay, but like, why don't I sort of do like um, speculative imaginings of what might be scenes or what could have happened in that play or something that scholars often debate what they think might have been taking place in that third play. But a lot of them say, oh, we think it was the conciliation. It was the reconciliation between Zeus and Prometheus. So after all the punishment and everything else, in the third play, Prometheus surrenders and capitulates and like rejoins, you know, Zeus's team. Um, and I thought, oh, well, God, what would our relationship be to technology if we'd had the whole cycle? Instead, we think of Prometheus as this kind of liberating force, or we think it's a sort of romantic figure who is going to give humans uh, technology, and we will be able to take care of ourselves, and they'll be able to create tools and weapons. And um, Prometheus is like the friend of man. But what if we knew that he gave in at the end, and that actually he succumbed to the power of brute force and the power of the state. Uh, so, which is how I see Zeus. So uh, that was a little bit the idea. Mm -hmm. And we started um, uh, asking, I think we had Dolly at that point. So like, I was working on this in bits and pieces over a few years, so I think we were at like GPT-2 and the first uh, release of Dolly, and we started asking Dolly to create images of ancient Greek theater masks. Many of them were quite interesting and sort of fucked up. Then I was working with a um, 
machine learning artist named Sukanya Aneja, um, who had been playing around with Runway, and so we started using Runway, which is another image generating AI. So we made these images uh, and had them 3D modeled and then printed, so we have these objects now. Um, and so we have one part of Prometheus Firebringer is like written and performed entirely by um, generative AI tools, uh, masks that we did, did uh, custom um, AI generated voices using uh, two actors, Okwi Okpokwasili and um, Livia Reiner lent their voices. So we made voices, we made voice prints of their voices who speak the text and the, uh, the script for the piece is a set of prompts that um, we <clears throat> use an API to go query the chat GPT and bring back text, which then goes through our audio system and comes out with the masks. So that's, but then I, but then that was all kind of like half the piece, right? And the other half is a talk that I give. Um, it's more organized than everything I'm saying right now. <laughs> Do you have a question? Um, yeah, I mean, I have to, uh, don't know what question, but um, so uh, maybe we talked about this a little bit before, but uh, it seems like there's a, a, you feel very mixed about um, AI because it, it, sometimes when, when you talk about it, you seem uh, uh, fascinated by what comes out of it. Mm. So, um, and then in other times, you seem uh, critical of the whole idea or trying to uh, un unmask it or expose it as something empty and dumb or so. I... Yeah, I mean, I use the word dumb to refer to, like, oh, those no. chatbots, right. right? But um, I'm, I'm not offended on behalf of the AI. I don't think AI is, like, dumb as right. a category. Um, <clears throat> I do think that generative AI is uh, bad for the world, period. <laughs> and um, I don't think that the cute, like, little chatbots there or other kinds of um, experiments with language and computation and algorithmic logic are necessarily bad for the world. Uh, but generative AI to me is doing something else. Uh, it's a different, um, just like the, the, the technology is different. It doesn't work the same, like it literally doesn't work the same way. And that's partly what you were talking about with the sort of unsupervised um, uh, learning process um, but then also one thing that I always noticed with the pieces that I was making is like the pieces were better uh, when the technology wasn't seamless because it gave opportunities for the audience to like think along with the piece so to question both how the thing was working and also what it was producing um, and the generative A's, I stuff, feels like what it does is actually it allows us to skip thinking. It lets us all just skip the whole process of thought. Like, you're supposed to write an essay for school. You're not going to read the book anymore. You're not going to, you know, think about it and try to fashion your thoughts into words and then be unsatisfied with how those words come out and do an editing process where you make it better. You're going to just give it to this thing, skip the thing, go straight to the results. Same with the visual art or the image generating AI tools, it lets you skip the process of trying to get better at what you're doing, or trying to figure out what you really want. You can just generate like a whole bunch of things and then be like, oh, I like that one. You know, as anyone who's ever like tried to play the piano or tried to write a poem or tried to sketch a tree, like knows, you know, that's not it. It's not actually about the thing you get at the end. It's about like the whole experience of trying to make it and trying to figure out what you'd like to communicate, and then there's some skills that need to be developed for you to be satisfied. Maybe you're never satisfied. That also teaches humility. That also teaches like fellow feeling with others who have done similar, you know, made similar efforts to try to express themselves in this way. There's a whole social context that, um, to me, gives artwork or any expression meaning, and. I was talking with someone down at Bryn Mawr about some of this stuff, and he was a technologist who sort of said, like, come on, come on, come on, but like, I never thought I could write a book, but now I'm thinking I could write a book. And I was like, but you won't be writing a book, you know? I mean, I, you know, I don't want to be rude to the guy, but like, that's not it. Like, writing a book is not about producing pages with text on them. It's about like, trying to like, think 
and communicate ideas in words. Like that's a totally different thing. So past some of the, you know, headline grabbing stuff where, you know, work of living artists is getting like exploited without their consent or knowledge uh, in a lot of cases, you know, past what it's doing to many people's livelihoods, uh, past what it, you know, Chap GPT is doing in terms of um, letting people kind of, um, of not only skip the whole process of thinking, but also like have sort of plausible deniability about the output that they give because it was not really there. So, you know, do we care if the results are like meaningless or discriminatory or shallow or wrong? Maybe we don't even care because like, it's not like I wrote that, you know, this thing wrote it. And then, I, yeah, sure, maybe I put my name on it, but like we all know that that responsibility for what you say in the world uh, does not just come from like putting your name on something. So that's um, maybe uh, like one way of talking about what I think is wrong with these tools. Yeah. No, and different from like, you know, like all the other, I'm so sorry, all the other stuff that we did was like, we wrote the code. You have to think, that's a creative process. Like you're thinking, what do I want this thing to do and how do I want it to work? And what happens if we do it this way versus this way? Do we get different results? And do we go back and like fine tune, finesse, restructure completely. That, that is just like a writing process in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, when you just get this tool that's like, just plug a little prompt in and it will do something. You don't know what it's doing. You don't know what it's drawing on. You don't know how it got those results. You know, I think that's a, it's a, it's a very different experience for the user or the coder or the person, human being. Yeah. 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 I'm curious oh, no, if I'm, there's I'm, a corollary in science and in, in terms of like what's interesting in your research, right? Like I'm sure there, you know, are there sort of like metrics or like kind of like canonical um, studies that show how we are learning or, you know, that kind of uncovers the process. And then of course you were saying before, um, you know, how useful is especially some of this proprietary technology for your research, you're actually interested in finding out how humans think, mm. right? And if you don't know the process, then it's not very useful. Is, is that correct? I mean, if you could speak to maybe um, yeah. the science. Oh, there are uh, two issues here, I guess. The uh, specific technologies that we're uh, using on uh, OpenAI's uh, website uh, these days are not the only way that we have to, um, the only ideas that we have for developing AI. Uh, it's a specific choice that these you know, corporations have made to develop um, programs that are um, in inscrutable and, and increasingly so, I guess. Part of it is for technological reasons. We don't really understand what they do, but uh, the another reason is for kind of uh, commercial capitalist reason, of, like the, the companies wanting to keep their secrets to themselves, um, so they can profit from the technologies um, at the expense of the other companies, which is, I guess, rational of them to do that. But um, it does mean that we increasingly, even if we don't care about humans at all, if we're just scientists trying to understand how these AIs uh, work, there's nothing for us to do anymore. Uh, we have to take these uh, companies' um, words that, you know, uh, th there's, there's no way that we can verify what they say about their models. Um, so that's that's one problem. The other problem, yeah, it's, it's, it's increasingly, um, irrelevant to uh, my area of research of understanding our, how humans think because the way that these models are taught um, is kind of diverging more and more from the way that humans learn language. So it used to be that maybe um, our computers were not fast enough to um, look at the entire internet and try to memorize it, but now they are. Uh, so the technology is developing in, in a way that is dramatically different from the humans. Um, and also, it turns out that a lot of the reasons that these um, language models work as well as they do is because you train them on a lot of things that are not actually language. So apparently training them on like source code is really useful, like Python and C and whatever. It's like just, you know, it, things that are very different from, from how people learn language. So um, 
I, that's why, I mean, maybe it's a little bit self-serving, but I feel like I need to develop my own models that are very different from those large language models for my own research. Um, and I guess my hope is that those models will also be easier to understand, um, easier to, you know, when, when they make um, an error or say something, as you say, like dis discriminatory, um, we can trace it back to the um, issue and the training process that gave rise to the problem. So yeah, basically what, what I'm saying that the, uh, <laughs> we, sh we should avoid this um, idea of um, in inevitability, that the, the only way to develop um, language technologies is the specific uh, language technologies that we have right now that, that the companies are finding the most lucrative, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can, you, can you really mimic human learning like, solely through language? I'm thinking like human development, of course, babies learn and our bodies before are in the mm -hmm. world, right? Before they have the ability to speak. Is, it, is there anything, is there any way that that development is kind of figuring into your research? Yeah, um, yeah And I'm thinking absolutely. about also works that you've done where the, the, um, the there's like vital signs that feed back in, isn't it the, um, your chant? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about, about yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, what was, which one? Infinite Sun. In, Infinite Sun, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that, actually, um, about how it's taking to account almost it's like a corollary for a body or some mm -hmm. sort of, you know, it, it's like extra other information, sort of feedback loops, maybe. I don't know if you, if you want to describe that work. But, um, yeah, I don't know. How does that, you know, are we going to get there with language and text? No, no, and I, yeah. it's not. Uh, but, um, if we want to uh, learn language the way that um, baby does, we need to put the um, computer program uh, in the world in some sense, or at least, at least mimic uh, what it would be like to be in the world. So at least you would have access to the you know visual uh, world or uh, perceptual um, world outside of language. Uh, and yeah, ideally you would have um, arms and legs and whatnot. <laughs> but those things are, I mean, none of those things are absolutely essential for learning language. You can definitely think about people um, who are able to learn language without access to some of those sources of information that are there's so many. Um, very, very helpful. Yeah, so that, that's, we, we do that in, in our uh, research, like to try to figure out how, um, how much perceptual um, information helps you learn language. And the other thing that we need to put into our systems, which is, I guess, the place where I thought that Chomsky was right after all, uh, is that, <laughs> um, no, there are many places where I think he was, he was right. Um, almost as many as the places I think he was wrong. Uh, so the, the basically there's, um, a, a, as, as, as a kind of out, outcome of um, evolution over many years, uh, we do we don't don't come into the world as like blank uh, slates. You know, we we do have certain um, ideas about what to expect from the world just from our you know the moment we we are born. Um, so that's that's the other piece of it that explains why we are able to learn language so much faster than those uh, language models. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about just listening to you guys is the f memory. Um, and sort of how that works, both like human, our sort of puny working memory, um, and the structures that we have to use to get around those limitations. And as an artist, of course, um, you've also talked with Max about some of the, you know, maybe artistic limitations that allow you to develop and um, find, um, you know, new new ways of presenting ideas or or feelings. So. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak more, both of you could speak to some of the, the way that memory figures in your work and um, maybe, I guess, some of the structures that because of our, our poor working memory, what we kind of have had to develop to circumvent that. Yeah, um, I 
don't know if it's necessarily a uh, an advantage that humans have that we have poor working memory or uh, poor long term memory as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does mean that we think in a very different way than the language models. So the language models can remember uh, with kind of perfect accuracy what um, you said, you know, two hours ago. It can um, recite the exact sequence of thousands of words that you just said. Um, and a human would have to summar summarize it, compress it into an image um, that might not be accurate, but it might lead to some sort of uh, creativity or uh, each one of us will come away with a somewhat different image of what you said. Um, whereas with the language model, there's just one possible output. Just the, and, and especially <laughs> in a world where there's only two big language models uh, in existence, there's going to be a lot of uniformity um, because of that in, in the language that we that we create and in the thoughts that we think. Uh, so that's an advantage that maybe not in, every individual human has, but as a society, I think, we, it leads to a lot of diversity. I don't know if I, would, if I have anything to say about memory. Mm, okay. Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I can say one thing, yeah. maybe, which is not, it's not like super relevant, I don't know, but it is about theater and memory, which um, that, you know, theater um, is like a discipline which is entirely about memory somehow. Um, you know, it's about like the actors remembering their lines and it's about um, the repetition night to night of the same thing that you rehearsed. Um, so there's always like something kind of interesting in the relationship of theater to the faculty of memory being almost like it's material, like, yeah. um, which also makes it maybe interesting to think about sort of working with computation and theater because these different kinds of memory are implicated. Um, but I don't know, like I said, that's not like super really relevant. <laughs> Look, it's very was relevant. Going. <laughs> Which was very interesting, what you had to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I'm interested in, I don't know, how are we doing? Okay. Um, I'm curious what, and this is sort of a broad question, but um, what you're frustrated about in terms of the current conversation around AI, if there are things that, um, and, and kind of where you're hoping it'll go, or what is productive about having such a conversation right now, it's definitely, you know, in the air. Yeah, it's like a weird moment because yeah. I spent so long um, talking about this stuff with people who uh, had not, like, played with these tools or had not um, thought that they were, uh, you know, so relevant to, like, the stuff that they do. And now all of a sudden, you know, everybody's heads are exploding and, like, there's this sort of apocalyptic feeling or there's, you know, everything's about to change, whatever. Maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, I feel like I have sort of two agendas with it in a way. The first is to talk about how kind of bad these tools are without getting into like apocalypse language because it's not apocalyptic. It's just really bad. And <laughs> <laughs> that's an important distinction. <laughs> but... Uh, but I do think, you know, sometimes the, the, like, this is so radical, it's so revolutionary, it's going to change everything, everyone's out of work, you know, we'll never do anything the same. Like, that language creates panic, um, but it also maybe makes these tools seem much more powerful than they really are. It increases the mystique around them. So I do hope that when you can say, like, in a very rational way why these things are bad and why, if it's not possible to not develop them further, at least we could maybe think about ways to limit their utility, to kind of keep them in a lane. They can have a lane, but they can't have the whole, you know, highway, I guess. Uh, so that's where I've, you know, come down a little bit is um, I want to see artists being able to um, advocate for like a mandatory opt-in system so that the image generating AIs can do some things, but they can't do everything that the language models can be used in some ways, but they're not allowed to be used everywhere, or they're not good, uh, they're not able to do everything. So that's one agenda. Yeah. Um, and then the second agenda I have, um, I was telling Thomas before we started, is um, I want to see artists just like 
think about the politics of the technology that they use. Um, and I, I feel as though, as a, as a species, artists are always interested in like new stuff that is cool, that we never heard of before, that can do new things. And um, there's a tendency to like want to jump in with two feet to um, anything that feels like exciting and fresh and like uh, could illuminate some part of existence that wasn't illuminated before. But there's a lot of ideology that comes along with these tools. There's a lot of power dynamics involved in them. Uh, and I worry that it's too easy for us to become like unwitting propagandists for the, for the technology and therefore for like the big tech companies. Because while some of the technology that we're talking about um, you know, seems a little dry or forbidding or complicated if you're just describing it as a um, you know, mathematical proposition, when you see like a groovy artwork that uses it, it all of a sudden seems like exciting and cool and accessible and um, neat, you know? So I would like uh, for, you know, artists particularly to think about why they're using the technology, how they're using it, and what the um, contexts are that affect their use of the tools. That's my little spiel about it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of um, sense to me. I think the, the, the um, wave of excitement when ChatGPT was released and people were posting funny screenshots of ChatGPT on Instagram or whatever and just giving open eye free publicity that, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the question is what, uh, if you, we can, Try to come up with a more specific no not not prescriptions. I know you're not going to prescribe anything to artists, but um, w how would you delineate that? Uh, what ways of engaging with uh, generative AI that are just uh, propaganda, so like for or you know doing Silicon Valley um, advertisement for them, versus ways that are more subversive and, and critical. Um, and I, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a kind of a good question and I don't want to call anyone out, you know, um, I think that <clears throat> using the tools in the way that they are <coughs> advertised, maybe not the best way. Um, so using them to like write your funny skit or like using them to write your play or whatever and then doing that play is like probably not for me um, like very interesting. Uh, but, you know, Prometheus, in a way, is my attempt, right? Like, I don't know if it succeeds, but it is my attempt to um, give them the best shot I could at being interesting on their own and also put them in a context where you can see uh, where, you, where uh, there are other questions to be asked. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. But I also wonder, like, very, very deeply and very sincerely whether, like, the right thing to do with these tools is not use them at all. Like, just forget it. Not to even have conversations about them. Yeah, not even talk about yeah, them. Yeah, let's just... <laughs> yeah, shush. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's where I am right now. Like, I don't think I'll ever use them again. We're going to do Prometheus three times in New York, and then that's the end of that. So we can go back to talking about our breakfast. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, where do you see them going? I mean, you know, like I start, I think ahead uh, on the art level, and I know that, uh, like the, you know, Emad Mostak, who is Stability AI, um, and Sam Altman, who's Open AI. Like these guys will very, uh, you know, say on the podcast or whatever that where they think this is going is um, a closed loop scenario. So the based on the data that exists about you and your preferences uh, from all of your social media use, that they will be able to generate prompts that will then be able to generate artwork, television shows, whatever. Uh, and there will be, you know, no human involvement will be needed at all, right? Like this is the, the fun, like, game or whatever, the fun fantasy that both of those guys have talked about uh, 
making that the, you know, with voice prints, once we have your voice in the can, we can endlessly make variations of it so we don't need human voice actors. Um, and with CGI and whatever else, like we can make great avatars so we can have an entirely personalized, like automated content production uh, cycle or whatever, like the whole thing from A to Z. Um, you know, that's like... Bleak. Bleak. It's pretty bleak. Uh, and nothing that I, nothing in that is impossible to do pretty much like right now. So that's bleak also. Yeah. Uh, I don't have uh, thoughts about like where this is going to be on, especially not in the kind of um, like visual content production or whatever uh, arena. I don't know um, a lot about this stuff and it's extremely hard to predict where things are going. Like if you asked me three years ago where things would be now, I would have given you an answer that's just completely inaccurate. So yeah, uh, things are just very weird and um, move very fast. Yeah. Uh, I'd, so I'm not gonna make uh, predictions. That's better, yeah, I won't make predictions. Yeah. All right. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll open it up right now just for, for a few audience questions. Um, so, um, yeah, why don't we, maybe I'm going to pass, gonna go Rome, like, yeah, I'm going to go roam. I would say, I would say, say it out loud and then maybe you just say it to the microphone again. Mm. Oh, oh. oh, okay. Why yeah. the producer? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so my first question is for Annie. Um, can it be done deeper into your creative process? When does AI come in? Um, it's during like your ideation, incubation, or execution, and then the follow-up question to that would be like, um, are you interested to like encourage AI to play in more active role in collaborating uh, during your work? We should roam because it's going to be better. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, so if I heard you right. Where does the <clears throat> AI come in, in in my process? And also, am I interested in developing a bigger role for it? Would I like it to be more um, a partner in the? Yeah, so um, it really depends. The Some pieces I made, uh, like the Yesterday Tomorrow piece, was really coming from me having a conversation with a programmer about you know as, asking him to teach me how does um, evolutionary, how do el evolutionary algorithmic models work? Um, and in our conversation, I said, like, Oh, so you could like, for example, turn yesterday into tomorrow. Uh, and we both laughed. You know, this is like a, how it happens a lot. Like we both laughed because it's like a dumb idea. And then the next day I think, that is a wonderful idea. <laughs> and um, the same thing happened with piece of work that I was talking to a programmer, a uh, friend of mine um, who works at IRCOM in, in Paris. And I, he asked what I was gonna do next. And I was like, well, I think I'm gonna do Markov models on Hamlet. And he said, oh, that's like the worst idea I ever heard. Um, so that is often, it, often a piece comes when somebody says like, or I think it's like the worst possible thing to do, that is a good sign. Um, so there's that, but I don't know. I mean, my thinking at the moment is that algorithmic theater for me is maybe kind of over um, because of generative AI. I don't know what more there is to do there um, that would mean, that would be meaningful. So, uh, yeah, next project, this is like a little transition moment, I think. I, I imagine that I will not be working artistically with AI at all going forward. Yeah. Uh, hi, I was wondering if there are um, language models that are trained exclusively in cognitive psychology <laughs> and um, who owns or trains these models and how wide they could be used in society. Like I see more and more um, these empathic technologies uh, around us, in us, with us. And uh, I guess they're based on studies, on real scientific studies. And also I was wondering how is your research going, uh, trying to, or managing to teach the model in a different way? Well, I actually am not familiar with the empathic uh, technology f 
fields. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But we, um, in uh, my research group and another research group, we do try to uh, create, uh, train models that are hopefully more similar to humans than the uh, biggest AI model trained by kind of commercial companies. Um, and those are always publicly um, available. They're you know just a, um, academic research, so we put everything out there for anyone to use. Unlike the companies. Hi, um, I was wondering what each of you thought about this idea that scientists build tools based on what they see represented in art often, right? That artists are sort of responsible for creating this imaginative experience of what technology can be. And so I guess I'm curious about this idea of artists not engaging with AI anymore. Could you also argue that it's, it's an opportunity for artists and scientists to work together to imagine a better way that this technology could look? Or is the cat already out of the bag? Thanks. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I kind of want to say that um, tech companies often love to work with artists because artists produce all kinds of wonderful new ideas. Um, you know, um, the, the AI guys, you know, are definitely influenced by a lot of science fiction, but like a lot of those books were written kind of as warnings and the AI guys are like, cool, sign me up for that. <laughs> so, you know, there's something a little, <clears throat> like the image of the world that I think is um, represented by, let's say, Sam Altman, is like, that's like a bad world. You know, that's uh, not a world that, or, you know, Musk, right? Um, <clears throat> so the... I always feel like it's a little bit of a dangerous thing. And I was thinking, OK, how about this as an analogy that I've been kind of wanting to um, beta test? Uh, I want to say museums and other arts institutions have been rethinking their relationship to uh, certain kinds of funding and certain kinds of funders. And they've taken the Sackler name off some buildings. Uh, and that was pretty hard to get them to do. But they've done it, many of them. and. Uh, that seems great, like there's an ethical issue with who's funding art. Wonder if, if you don't take money from the Sacklers, you shouldn't take money from Meta. Like, you shouldn't take money from Silicon Valley generally. They've kind of been nothing but bad news for us. The way that they're doing technology is um, anti-competitive. It's about, uh, you know, incredibly invasive surveillance technology. Uh, it is full of um, bad, demonstrably bad effects in the world about a lot of things that we care about. Uh, and, you know, somebody, when I, when I tried this analogy out once, that my friend who's like a little bit more open to taking some VC money, um, he was like, well, come on, come on, come on. I mean, the Sackler is like, the, you know, a lot of people died. And I sort of felt, well, I'm going to, again, like counterpoint, like one, what if Facebook actually has been directly responsible for more death and societal harm than the Sacklers could ever dream in their, you know, wildest fantasies? So this is kind of, I, mean, I am a little bit like at the moment sounding possibly like a crazy person, but I'm interested in exploring like what happens if we actually say uh, AI abolition like as a movement, um, I don't know. But, or can we think about AI's development the same way we would think about, um, you know, can we think about AI abolition in the same way we think about prison abolition? So it doesn't mean that there is no consequence for uh, wrongdoing. It means that communities take responsibility for uh, determining the nature of that consequence uh, in light of like many contextual factors and values. So like wonder if you could think about an AI that would be developed by people that, for uh, tools that they want for specific purposes. One of the things that happens I think in the world of Silicon Valley is that a lot of technologies get developed before there's a purpose for them. 
then it's a bit of a scramble to try to figure out what the purpose is, which creates all kinds of you know, hype cycles uh, and a lot of imposition of technologies on people who weren't asking for them. So, you know, as you're starting to think about like what would a different technical model be for creating something like AI, I wonder like is there a different like social model for it as well? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, but. Let's get together and get some funding. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't agree with everything you said, but I agree with the last point. Uh, but it <laughs> um, maybe some of the others. Yeah, no, but I, I, I think that, the, but don't you think that um, art can um, show the way towards the sort of societal um, change that you're describing? Yeah, totally, okay. but I don't know if collaborating, I mean, it depends what mm. collaborating with technologists means, right? right? Like, yeah. there's loads of artists, technologists, everyone I've ever worked with, for example, on my pieces, um, you know, they're not, um, they're not like crypto bros or whatever, you know, like there's like lots of different ways to do it. But um, so, yeah. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. But it's not necessarily where like the companies want to put the big money because it doesn't do the, you know, marketing work. Right. Um, you had said at one point that it's bad, but it's not apocalyptic. It's not something to like panic about. Why should we not panic about it? Yeah. All right, go ahead, panic. Um, I don't know. I mean, the thing about panic is that it's paralyzing. So, like, there's a practical reason not to panic, which is um, that it uh, prevents us from, like, you know, accurately defining what the problems are. And it prevents us from, you know, uh, investing time to try to solve them. Uh, there's obviously, there's like totally a worst case scenario. I don't think it's about like, uh, like the, the robot who's going to turn us all into paper clips or whatever. Like I don't think it's like the robot that's going to press like abort the world button. Like, you know, I do think there's a real danger that... Um, a nihilism uh, that these tools will encourage and foster nihilism uh, because the language they produce does not mean anything, um, even kind of when it does, if you know what I mean. So that, to me, is the biggest danger. Like nihilism, you know, we're already living through a very scary period of time in terms of climate, in terms of, uh, you know, very uh, dangerous, like, political ideologies that we sort of thought were maybe not going to eternally return and have. And um, so I don't know that we, like, panic is, doesn't seem like the right um, response. One thing that I think could be a good response is to recognize, like, how actually climate and rising fascism and... Um, these, this kind of technology are uh, linked. They're not totally separable. They affect each other and they're intertwined in a lot of ways. Um, so I don't know. You know, I don't know what to tell you about that. Yeah, I don't think we should panic, but I think that there are uh, consequences that we need to deal with as a society, just in terms of new institutions, different ways of redistributing wealth, uh, but, but I mean, we can, we, we can do it. I think we've lived through um, a lot of technological changes in the last 200 years or whatever, and we survived the society. Some of us. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we, we could do this better, maybe, than some, other, than some of the uh, previous technological transitions, but I think that uh, the uh, panic uh, invites the, the despair uh, as opposed to action, which is maybe what you were saying. Yeah, panic invites despair, and also like LLMs invite despair. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right, do we have time for one more? Or... No? No, yeah, we don't have time. One more. For... One more, okay. She raised her hand earlier. Uh, can I have two questions? Okay. <laughs> uh, so the first one is that do Only you think one. Uh, the Library of Bebo is a good analogy of large language models? Sorry? The Library of Babel. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
uh -huh. that you are not actually creating anything. The meaning are extracted by the humans. Mm -hmm. And only humans um, can generate counterfactuals and we can make console inference because in the neural networks, there's no causality, there's only associations. Yes. And on um, the causality part are actually like, um, just like how quantum mechanics, uh, we find a discrete particle, we find it to be deterministic. Well, in fact, they can um, exist in the two states. So um, actually, it is still the, uh, the human artist or the human parser who is um, in some sense constructed the meaning of this piece of text. The interpreter is the speaker, the speaker is the parser. There's a recursion that um, never ends and um, we always need do you think the Library of Babel is a good analogy? <laughs> of large Here's numbers? what I think. <laughs> My question is, do you agree with me? <laughs> um, I do, I do. I love uh, the, um, the, the Borges story is what you're referring to. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's a, um, it's a wonderful story and it's a wonderful metaphor for, um, you know, uh, maybe one aspect of what we're experiencing, for sure, yeah. All right, all right. thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ling Ling, Annie, and Paul. And please join us for some wine and light refreshments behind the curtain. Thank you all.